Those who weren't killed, captured or wounded headed for the mountains or were hidden by the villagers. They say they had little time to look at the scenery, but they seem to remember this battleground like no others. They were hiding among the gods of Mount Olympus and retreating through the pages of their own history books to one of the most famous ancient battlefields, Thermopylae. The Spartan king Leonidas and 300 soldiers in 480 BC held up the Persian army here. In 1941, Winston Churchill was romanced by the notion it would happen again. He later said he did not give up hope of a final stand at Thermopylae. Every student of ancient history knows the story of the famous Spartan stand. Many of the Australian soldiers who passed this way, themselves barely out of school, knew it well. But strangely enough, what isn't taught today is the story of our own Spartan stand and our own Spartan, who's now a retired accountant living in Melbourne. Well, the pass itself was a zigzag of road up a very steep hill and we were parked, we had the guns dug in on the forward edge of the road, sort of over the edge of the gravel, and that was the only spot we could find anywhere on the pass to put them. The action of the two Australian guns at Brelos Pass has found its way into local folklore. Two men from the village of Brelos took me to where the guns were sighted. The objective was to hold up the advance so the remainder of the Allied force could be evacuated. It was a suicide mission. The guns were sighted in full view of the Germans on the plain below. But remarkably, night and day, for 21 hours, they held on, with enemy artillery raining in on them. We got fired back at by guns that fire a 100-pound shell. We heard the sound before the shell arrived, just briefly, for about half a second. It was just enough for you to duck before the shell arrived. The noise is almost unbearable on the eardrums. One shell must have landed right amongst them. And when I got back from taking this fella up the hill and ringing through, we found that uh, we had another five killed and uh, another couple injured. The two guns at the Brelos Pass probably enabled thousands more Allied troops to get away. Twelve Hurricane aircraft had a similar role. They were sent up above Athens to face as many as 200 German planes. Roald Dahl filled out his logbook for what might have been the last time. I mean, you, you, you were doing this all the time and up there and then glancing in your rear view mirror like a car. Uh, because um, they're on you in one second. And, and, and you also, you never stop in a battle like that. Turn, you never fry a straight and level for three seconds. You're turning this way, turning that way. And, and you really wait, there were so many of them that uh, all you had to do was wait for one to come across your sights. And then you had a pop at him. <laughs> you, you sweat like anything, you get, it's tension. You're not, not in the least frightened. You're, you're, you're absolutely wound up and uh, minutes go by uh, as though they're seconds, you know. Nothing counts except uh, this amazing battle you're in. It, it, it is amazing. I'm, I'm glad I was in it, actually. <laughs> Drivers who steer their trucks by night through mountain passes get the forces back to the coast clear of the Germans. The rear guard enabled the majority to get away. 
they set about immobilizing some of the 8,000 discarded vehicles. The Greece evacuation was Dunkirk or Gallipoli without the glory. The Anzacs evacuated quite literally on Anzac Day, leaving behind a proportion of their pride and too many of their men, including some wounded. Soldiers seriously injured in the fighting were left to carry another wound. There was no effort whatsoever made to get us out. Nobody tried an inch. Everybody was too busy heading the other way. Uh, I don't say the infantry blokes themselves, because I think they went back and took up another position somewhere, but the powers that be, they, they, surely they could have organised a gang of blokes with trucks, anything, wheelbarrows, to come and get us and take us away. But there was nothing, not a sound. Like we were left, just like a lot of old blown out motor tyres, they left us there. And uh, that annoyed me, but I did it. But most of the Australians got away. Some 6,500 were deposited here on the island of Crete alongside evacuated New Zealand, British and Greek servicemen. The Allies had to prevent the Germans from capturing any of the three airstrips on the island. A collaboration of New South Welshmen and West Australians were camouflaged and waiting in olive groves around the airstrip at Rethamon. The peaceful Cretan landscape offered only a moment's reprieve. Germany's plan to conquer the island and secure their southern flank was known in detail by British intelligence. On May 20, the Germans arrived right on time. Sechs Uhr zehn. Vor uns Kreta. Die Nervenprobe für Besatzung und Springer beginnt. Im Tiefflug überfliegen wir die kretische Küste. First of all, there was this noise like a great swarm of bees it seemed to me to looking back on it just before you could sort of more or less sense rather than saw and then way out in the distance you could see this great black cloud as it were very indistinct but then the noise and the throbbing grew louder and it was obvious it was a great armada of aircraft of all description the machine steigt and stirbs in Hützeböen. This was the world's first major aerial invasion. And this time, the opposing forces were more evenly balanced. The German soldiers were better armed than the enemy below, but the Germans were outnumbered. And in the air, the lumbering transport planes were easy targets. We were the first ones to go to Retimo and we were suddenly noticing that we were shot at. All sorts of uh, calibers and uh, some of uh, our comrades were hit. One of them before me was hit in the head and was dead. The parachutes opened. It, it was an incredible sight, and it was it was almost beautiful. And it, it's we sort of stopped and said, "Look at that." And then we suddenly realised what it was. It was paratroops. Everywhere you looked, there were these parachutes coming down. It was 
you just didn't take any. You were petrified for a moment at this colossal scene of all these colours. And I think, really, everyone was sort of bloody stunned and speechless. Uh, we were uh, delighted to leave the aircraft because we thought they couldn't uh, hit us as easily as they could in the aircraft. But uh, uh, that was not so. <clears throat> in the air, I heard this whistling of bullets around me. But uh, the whistling is not so bad to hear because you know everything you hear is already past you. It can't hit you anymore. And then I looked down and I saw some soldiers. They were sort of legs dangling just right above you and without small arms. And those legs were Jerry's and they were actually shooting from up there and flinging down hand grenades as they came. I didn't know at that time there were Australian soldiers just shooting at me. And well, I was very glad uh, I didn't uh, land in the middle of them, but some 20 or 30 yards off from them. And this German soldier came along with a, one of his automatic small arms, and he was obviously out after Johnny Learmont and I. John had two rounds in his service revolver, that's all he could scrounge, but Johnny just sort of caught him off guard and just with one shot, and he got him right through the heart, and he just fell in a heap in this little sunken road. Poor devil, he was had ginger hair. He laid there for days and days and days. I've never seen a human being dying before that. And uh, that was on the first day already of uh, our uh, battle. And uh, after that, of course, we have seen every day dozens and dozens dying and lying there dead. We couldn't bury them, of course, during all this time. It was practically impossible. We were able to collect our dead and bury them reasonably soon after. But it was difficult, and for days, the bodies of the German dead, and of course they, God, and there's nothing like that sweet, sickly smell of, of rotting human corpse and flesh. It's, geez, it's everywhere. Den Verwundeten gilt die ganze Fürsorge der mit abgesprungenen Sanitätssoldaten. If by now Anzac Honor needed redemption, then redemption was to be found at Rethemann. The smell of death was not all that was reminiscent of Gallipoli. The combatants also abided by the same old-fashioned notion of fair play, not seen later in the war. Both sides fought till the last, stopped to tend their wounded and bury their dead, and then, just as fiercely, fought on. Their fighting was extremely fair. And uh, I have, uh, during the last war, and uh, served for three years during the war in Russia, and I was uh, in other parts uh, of the war, and I must say this fairness which existed between the Australians and the Germans in Australia has nowhere else existed. After a week of fighting at Rethamon, the Australians had won, but elsewhere on the island, the fortunes of war had swung against them. The Germans were able to take the other airstrip at Malamy from the New Zealanders and bring in enough reinforcements to secure the island. Unglaublich die Ruhe der Männer trotz feindlichen Artilleriefeuers. Eine unerhörte Leistung des Flugzeugführers. Das Artilleriefeuer scheint nachzulassen. I said, oh, rock. There's all our tanks and things coming along. <laughs> he got his binoculars out and he said, and they're not our tanks. And then as he was speaking, I could see great black crosses on those things. Actually, we were quite surprised because we had always expected the opposite to happen. 
we thought uh, it might take another fortnight or so to fight there, and then we might have to surrender or shoot ourselves. That was what we expected. And on the 30th uh, of May, the Austrian and Bavarian mountain troops arrived, and uh, I think this was the most beautiful day of my life. <laughs> die kampfentscheidende Luftverbindung mit dem Festland ist geschaffen und damit die Voraussetzung für das Gelingen des Unternehmens Greta. What to do? Well, being a regular officer, there wasn't much future in surrendering, but finally I decided that was the thing to do. I first of all sent down my quartermaster with a white flag, but uh, they didn't seem to take much notice of him, and he came back to say that they didn't seem to recognize the white flag. So I took it from him, and I went down the little path onto and across the airstrip and surrendered my force at Retimo. We all went down onto the airstrip. The Messerschmitts came in and did their ruddy victory rail over us and, and we just sat on the airstrip and I said, just trust your tin hats in a heap and that was it. The Royal Navy courageously and at great cost managed once again to evacuate most of the men. The majority of the Australians returned to Alexandria greatly relieved. But the prized 6th Division left one third of its men behind. All sides lost heavily. The New Zealanders had greater numbers killed, the British had more men taken prisoner. 594 Australians died in Greece and Crete, and among these men are some of the 5,132 Australians who were captured. Yeah, there's two things that you reckon will never happen to you. One that you'll get killed or wounded, and the other one that you'll get captured like you never. I suppose the thought of getting captured never enters anyone's mind. That's the last card in the pack completely. The only one thing that I thought were World War One went on for four years, and this place, this one's been going a couple of years now, so I can't go on as long as World War One. Famous last words, because I was four years in Germany. Yeah, four of the best years of my life. Down the drain, because was when I was 22 till I was 26, what great times they are when you think of them. They just went. Not all the Australians left in Crete ended up behind barbed wire. For the next months, small parties made their way back to the Middle East. Few, if any, could have made it but for the bravery of the people of Greece and Crete who risked execution by helping the Allies. We had Norman for about six months uh, hidden here. And then my father took him, after six months, the resistance, I mean, the resistance grew in Crete as soon as actually, virtually, the Germans landed. So uh, after six months, my father took Norman and uh, took him up in the mountains, and then they start taking people that were left behind uh, to Egypt. Along Cretan roadsides today, the monuments stand as bleak tributes to the villagers executed in reprisal by German occupation troops. Uh, we never heard of Norman again. We don't know what happened to him. I know that if he was alive, certainly he would come back.
Many more Australians were eventually liberated from behind the German lines. Left behind in the mountain villages today, along with the odd rusting bayonet, is a fine residue of mutual respect. And somewhere up there in the clouds of Greek mythology, the Anzac legend, it seems, has also found a home. I think what it was, we felt they were like us. Um, brave, a little bit crazy, you know, not uh, just, oh, well, we can't do this because uh, it is not, uh, you know, it's not normal or other people don't do it. Um, they were not only brave, they were happy people. It's remarkable, but so many of these villagers seem to have stories which they recall and retell of the brave Anzac warriors, like the one of the wounded Australian soldier who died rather than betray the villagers who helped him. And like so much of the Anzac legend, some of it's probably true and some of it's probably not true. And in the end, I have to confess, I find myself as easily romanced by all of this as every other Australian who's tried to tell this story. The graveyard on Crete, like the graveyards at Gallipoli, are perpetual corners of the Anzac legend, the real estate of no tomorrows. As always, I find it too easy to become a prisoner of my own sentiment. I have to force myself to ask why they died and why they came here, just as we were forced to ask the questions 50 years ago, after the Greek tragedy was played out. And what the post-mortem reveals is a greater distancing between Australia and Great Britain than we can ever pretend occurred after Gallipoli. It, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter how will you fight or how, what efforts you take to get back and fight another day or what actions you take. I mean, you only win or lose. There's no running second. And uh, we were, I never saw an aeroplane or a tank owned by the Allies in the whole of the time I was over there. And they had everything. It was absolutely dreadful. We were just lambs for the slaughter. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Churchill and his ideas just used the colonials and use them, he certainly did. I, I think he, 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 he had a, a phobia about the Balkans and always cocked it. He did it in the first war with Gallipoli and now he did it in this one in, in, in the Greek campaign, the first Greek campaign. Uh, we all were told it might have been a gesture to persuade the Americans uh, how loyal we were and how brave we were, but it's a, a damn silly gesture. Well, it was almost an unmitigated disaster in terms of people killed, in terms of the decimation of the Mediterranean fleet, and particularly in terms of the effect on the Middle East campaign. It nearly caused Britain to be expelled from Egypt altogether and the loss of 500,000 men. Uh, and it meant that the Middle East campaign dragged on for another two years until 1943. General Blamey admitted with the benefit of hindsight we didn't have a dog of a chance from the start. After the campaign, the official correspondent Kenneth Slesser was furious our governments would gamble with Australian lives on a wild chance wilder than Gallipoli. Slesser also wrote privately of the British accusation that the AIF in Greece had behaved disgracefully, jettisoning their rifles and arms, losing all control and withdrawing in panic. While the Australian post-mortem questioned the worth and wisdom of the British High Command, the British post-mortem questioned the merit of the Australian fighting man. Well, there are many facets of the Anzac legend. Mateship, uh, Australians who were uh, uh, really stick in and fight it out. I think the Australia, that part of the legend was still in, in, in uh, still intact. But the, the idea that the Australians would always fight well took a bit of a knock in Greece. 
I mean, after the First World War, the British, the general British view of Australians uh, had changed completely. The old convict stain had been pretty much wiped out. Australians had proved themselves on the battlefield. Well, after 1941, we were back to pre-World War I. The old view of Australians as being coming from bad stock for the convict stain, the Irish working class, all that came to the fore again. All set, come in, Spiller. But among the men, there was not much questioning then, there is not much questioning now. The muted, murmured private recollections are not meant for broadcast. And from this no man's land, the myths and legends are passed on. But if you are committed as part of the Australian army to a cause or to an expedition, to an operation, you must assume, you do assume, I think, that it's for a good reason. If you discover it later that it was rubbish, well, that's too late. But having committed yourself to it, you're really going to see it through and not fold up. You know, there two times when I would have sold out pretty cheaply, but I suppose survival's a pretty strong, basic thing in all of us. And, and but, you know, me, I'm not, I'm now here, I just put my head down and moved along with, well, I did have a few moments, but in the main, I just tried to play it as cool as I could. So what do you think you should say to your grandsons on Anzac Day? Well, have a look, you know. Don't get carried away by the band and the flag and uh, a nice marching done by the old boys. I said it's not all flags and bands and marching. It's got its dirtier moments. But uh, I don't discourage them. I said let's be proud, you know, of the fact that uh, we've fought in wars. When our fathers and grandfathers marched to school past the honour rolls and monuments, they gathered up without noticing half-understood notions of chivalry, honour and duty. When these children wander past the monuments and honour rolls, it's hard to imagine them marching so proudly for Britain. Succeeding generations have, I'm sure, quietly discarded the habit of presuming the mother country knows best. It also seems doubtful they'll be so captivated by the notion that Australians are an invincible warrior race. But it's just as hard to be certain that given the chance to prove our nation and themselves, they would not do it all again. Now, boys, would you like to send a cheerio home through the Australian photographic unit? Yes! Yeah. Yeah. Right, number one, come on, buddy. Gimpy, greetings to you all. We Queensland boys are fitting well and holding our own. He's another Mick, where are you? Come on. Mick Taylor sends greetings to Tasmania. How about a cargo or two of apples? We forget how they taste. You're telling me. Come on, this piano tickler, where are you? Liam James from Dunedin, we send very kind regards and good wishes and cheerio to New Zealand. Of course, not forgetting Sydney. All I can say is that we're just raring to go. Kia ora, everyone. Come on, Stoney. Hello, South Australia. Cheerio, John, Judy, and all at home in Adelaide. Also elders in all states. Now, where's Nugget? Here I am. You've had a lot to say, old boy. What about you giving them our message? You're telling me. Are we spawning? I'll say we are. Hitler, you're doomed. You're not in the boom. You've simply proved a failure. Give up, you run. You're not in the hunt. And let us go back to Australia. Hooray!